tonight. I'm really excited about this event. The issue of proper recycling or what properly goes in our recycling bin has been a topic at almost every one of our meetings at the Recycling Task Force. So I was so thrilled that Cheryl Baldwin was able to come here tonight and give us a primer, a 101 on how to do it the right way. Uh, Cheryl has been with uh, DEEP for over 10 years. She's an environmental analyst, and I, just, uh, I get numerous emails, information, education for municipal officials, uh, basically anyone who wants to get up to speed on uh, what we can do for our environment starting in our very own homes. So um, help me in welcome Cheryl uh, to Milford. And the last thing I want to tell you about, if anyone is interested in joining the Recycling Task Force, it is, uh, we meet monthly, generally, uh, in the evening at Parsons. So I'm just going to uh, leave this on the back table, put your name and your email, and I will add you to our distribution list. Our next event is October 1st, and we're going to be meeting at the Firehouse Gallery to view an exhibit by an artist who um, creates art using recycled materials. Um, his name is Faustin Adenarin, and that event is at 7 o'clock, October 1st. And um, his artist statement is that you can tell a lot about a society by what it throws out. So um, without further ado, uh, welcome, Cheryl. Thank you. And applause to you because it's a beautiful day. This is where you decided to spend your evening, so thank you for joining me. So, uh, I'm here to talk about recycling, so I think the first thing I'm going to do is actually, I'm just going to define what recycling is, and I think that's a good place for us to start. So we often think about this as recycling, right? We rinse our containers, we gather our newspapers, and we put them in our bin, and we put them in our cart, and then we put them on the curb. And that's an important step of recycling, but that's not everything. The materials are then picked up by a big truck, and they're brought to a facility. We call the materials recovery facilities. And there, the materials are separated and sorted into different categories. And then they're actually bailed to specification. They're put in big, big bricks of things with wires around them. So you have all your milk jugs, or all your milk cartons, or all your newspaper, or all your cardboard are separated and bailed to a certain specification so that they can then sell it to an end market. That end market, in the case of maybe a milk jug, they might make little plastic pellets or maybe they make paper pulp and then they're going to make another product, which is in this case a milk jug, which we then buy. We use it, we rinse it, and we put it back in the bin. And that is the true cycle of recycling. If we're not doing every step, then it's actually not recycled. Now, who's been reading about the New York Times and that all of our recyclables are being trashed? Well, that's not quite the case. If you have a lot of, ooh. <laughs> does that, excuse me, does that help you with the lights on or off? Okay. <laughs> We can we can do a little bit like that. Right. Is that good or bad? Okay. So you got if I hear snoring, I know. I <laughs> can. All right. So the Chinese sword. The Chinese sword is a policy that was implemented, and you may have started hearing about it maybe in late 2018, and definitely in 2019. But those of us in the industry have known for a number of years that this has been coming because China has consistently started purchasing less and less material. And so if we start at the bottom, where you see 2017, in 2017, China purchased about 60% of all our recycling paper in the country. And they did about 36% of our plastic. And glass stays local. It, it's heavy, so usually it's, within, it's sold within a 500 mile radius. In 2018, we're still selling paper, meaning the country is still selling paper to China, but it's only 40% of the materials that we generate, and it's only cardboard. 
plastic, we have 5% going to China. Glass continues to be local. Now in 2019, I only have the, uh, the first quarter, but in the first quarter, we have a little bit less going. We have 30%, again, only cardboard, and less than 5% of our plastic. And again, glass is local. So it's not that uh, China is preventing us from recycling or impacting all of our markets. <coughs> markets fluctuate. They fluctuate all the time. We, about 10 years ago, we also had a huge depression. This is definitely a little bit worse. But you know what, markets go down and then they also go up. And so what we're also finding, because of the fiber issue in that we generate a lot of uh, paper and other fiber, that we have new markets coming out, which is really exciting. So in, we're finding that we're finding domestic markets. So less is going overseas, which is kind of exciting. So we have new paper mills coming up, including Nine Dragons, great name. <laughs> Nine Dragons is actually a Chinese company <laughs> that are taking over and reestablishing uh, re old mills that we closed down because they're companies that can't get product anymore in their own country. So they're coming here to get it. And so it gives you a sense of like there's some inconsistencies, but materials is still being wanted and it's still being processed. So we have new facilities coming up in Alabama, West Virginia, Washington and Ohio, South Carolina, and more mills coming on board in 2020 as well as 2021, including facilities that are going to be able to handle more glass. <coughs> and then this summer there's an article that says, wait, 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 China's like, I don't want to, I don't want to say zero to everything. And so it tells you that it's forever changing where you may still be hearing about that markets are done. You know, even China saying, well, we want some stuff. We're not completely prepared to say no to everything. Because they need that material as an end market for manufacturing. Now recently, NERC, NERC is the Northeast Recycling Council, and they did a survey of materials recovery facilities, or MRFs. And they wanted to understand how are MRFs handling uh, the challenges of the markets, and what they found is that a ton of mixed recyclables, so if we gathered all of our mixed recyclables and we sorted out just a ton of it, it's worth about $46 if you were selling it on the market, whereas last year it was worth 52 So my big point here is that it's still valuable. It's just less. So a lot of folks have me coming because they're freaking out because they think that they're doing it wrong. Does everybody think they're doing it wrong? Yes. Mm -hmm. No. Maybe. A lot of people. Well, it's hard. Um, and the reason it's hard is that this busy slide, this busy graph, is telling us that there are 5,000 to 10,000 new products going on our retail shelves every year. I'm going to repeat that. 5,000 to 10,000 new products are being put onto our retail shelves every year. Do you think those companies are telling me what's coming onto the shelves? Do you think they're telling the Merck companies what's coming onto the shelves? No. No. And not all of them are actually designing products or packaging that can actually work in our facilities to be able to be separated, or their materials that cannot be recovered. And so there is a disconnect. Now who has seen um, those little images, the little arrows with the numbers in it? Yes. Show of hands. And who uses them? Sort of. Okay. Well, good for you if you've stopped using them. And if you're still using them, I'm sorry to say, you're going to have to ease out of using them. And the reason being is that those are resin identification codes. They're identification, they're identifying the type of resin for industry to be able to understand what kind of plastic it is so they can sell it. It's never meant to be educational for us. In the 90s, if you were recycling in the 90s, everybody thought it might be a really good idea, but now it's just too confusing. Because everybody thinks because there's a number and an arrow, they think it's good to go, and it's not. This is a much better label to look for. This is called the How to Recycle Label. 
And so it does give you the arrows, it identifies the material, and then it tells you how to do it. And in this case, empty the plastic bottle and put the bottle cap back on. And they have lots of different kinds of labels. So depending on the company and what type of packaging, they can give you different instructions to help you understand how to prepare that material for recycling. So it's a great tool, and more and more companies are beginning to use it, which is great. Now something I wanted to share, uh, Walmart is beginning to use it a lot. And while I don't want to focus on just one company, Walmart is doing some really interesting things. And as we know, Walmart's a very large company, and they have a huge say in the, the industry in terms of how we buy and sell materials, consumer goods in our homes. And they say by 2025, they're going to make sure that all the private labels, so everything that says Walmart label, is going to be 100% recyclable, reusable, or industrially compostable. That's a huge undertaking for a company of this size. They're also saying that by 2025, they're going to have recycled content in all of their packaging, by 20% recycled content. Remember when we talked about the recycling, where we want to make sure that you know, it becomes, it's sold to an end market, and then it's made into another bottle. That bottle has recycled content in it. It's materials that came from our programs to make a new product. So post-consumer recycled content means that we have used a product, we put it back in the system to make a new item. By 2022, they want to label 100% of their food and consumable private brands with the How to Recycle label. That's huge. They're going to be impacting others. Others are going to follow suit, which is very exciting. And then they're also working with suppliers to eliminate non-recyclable packaging. Non-recyclable packaging? What does that mean? They're actually defining what is recyclable, and it follows actually the EPA's definitions of recyclable, at least what we're moving into as a country. 60% of consumers must have access to be able to recycle that material. So we all have access to doing soda bottles, milk jugs, newspaper, that is recyclable. Infrastructure for processing, meaning our MRFs are capable of collecting and sorting that. And currently, Walmart really only wants to use these resin types. And that actually follows the same as the what's in what's out model. So all of a sudden, you see Connecticut is aligning with the rest of the country or maybe the rest of the country is beginning to align with Connecticut. <laughs> so this, this is the beginning of our first quiz. Are you ready? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how many folks knew or know that recycling is mandatory in Connecticut? Did you know that? No. Well, it's mandatory in Connecticut. <laughs> So here comes the quiz. Was the law that mandated recycling passed in 1975, 1989, or 2012? So show of hands. Who thinks it passed in 1975? Who thinks it passed in 1989? And who thinks it passed in 2012? All right, some of you are very skeptical. I didn't see any. <laughs> and actually, uh, the first law passed in 1989, so kudos folks who said that. And it was sort of a trick question because we had a second law in 2012 that expanded the list of mandatory materials. And these are the mandatory materials in Connecticut. And if we divide that list and we look at just the top, you'll see it's glass and metal food and beverage containers, plastic containers, corrugated cardboard, boxboard, newspaper magazines, white and colored office and that's pretty much what we've always wanted you to recycle, and it continues to be what we want us to recycle. Now all the other things may be recyclable and should be disposed of properly, but they don't go in your blue bin. And so there's a difference between what is acceptable and what is recyclable. So we have a lot of other materials that are recyclable, but they're not acceptable in the blue bin. 
You have an electronics program at your transfer station. Mm -hmm. Recyclable, but not acceptable in the blue bin. Paint is accepted at local retailers and hardware stores. Recyclable, but not acceptable in the blue bin. Mattresses, you also do at the transfer station. I don't know how you would fit that in your blue bin, but it's not accepted. <laughs> And then, of course, communities have household hazardous waste events. They may have paper shredding events. We know that plastic bags and plastic wrap can go to local retailers or our supermarkets and grocery stores. We might bring our eyeglasses to the Lions Club. We might bring food scraps to our compost bin, textiles to Goodwill or a local thrift shop. Maybe we bring books to a, a rummage sale or a church group or perhaps the library. All of these materials may have be able to be reused or recycled, but they should not go in our blue bin. And then to take a step back, I'm here really to push recycling and help you understand sort of what goes in and what goes out. But honestly, recycling, of course, is always the third R, which means it's not the best R. The best R is actually to rethink and say, do we actually need that item? Is there another way in which we could purchase? an item of what we want. Should we refuse free stuff? I've been reading up on zero waste and somebody was encouraging as a zero waste strategy to not accept free stuff. And when I think of it at first, I was like, what do you mean not accept free stuff? <laughs> and then I started thinking, well, it's true. When I go to a hotel, I take the free shampoo. And I use it, even though I have a big shampoo bottle that can go in my recycling bin after I finish the shampoo, but the smaller ones cannot. Small bottles don't work in our system. And so it is an interesting thought of, can we reduce the amount of trash that we generate by rethinking what we take and use? We also want to purchase differently, so we're buying things that can be repaired, durable items, and extend the life of those items. So I encourage you to think about that as well. Even though recycling is great, it's not the, the best. We can do better by trying to reduce our waste as well. So the department, every five to six years, does a strategic plan. And in preparation of that plan, we actually do a number of studies. We hire con uh, consultants to help us understand what is still in our trash, or what is the characterization of our trash as well as what is the characterization of our recycling stream. And so we were really curious to understand, now that single stream has been around for a while, and most communities are engaged in mixing it all together, how are we doing? How much contamination do we have? And I'm sure you've read about articles around the country in terms of very high levels of contamination. And so we were really excited to learn more and what kinds of contamination there was as well. So anybody want to guess how much contamination we have in Connecticut in our MRFs? 35%. Silence. Excuse me? 35%. 35? Actually, we're doing pretty good. Much better than that. I think the, in terms of the national average, they're finding 25. But we have about 14 to 19% contamination. And that was in 2015 before this campaign, where we're all relearning and how to do a little bit better job. What we did find, that, though, is what the top five contaminants were. Plastic bags being the big one. And shredded paper is a problem. And bag recyclables are waste, so not just the individual plastic bag, but bag materials. And it's something that we in the industry call tanglers. And that could be garden hoses, hangers, wire, <coughs> even clothing. And then bottle caps. Bottle caps are a big problem. They contaminate the glass. And so to come up with a list, to be able to create an education and promotion program, we really needed to figure out what is acceptable in our programs. Because every town accepted something else. I used to do education programs, and it used to be a joke that you would be Milford, you would be West Haven, you'd be New Haven, you'd be Hamden, you'd be North Haven, you'd be et cetera. And everybody had a different answer, even though all of those communities were bringing to the same facility. So we needed to standardize. And so in standardizing, we met with all the MRF operators. And these are the questions we asked them. We went through every single item. Every single item we could think about. 
and we said, is this item <coughs> potentially harmful or unsafe for your employees? Mm. And the reason that question is asked, if you've never been to a MRF, or you've never seen like a little video of one, what happens is all our materials are brought in, and they're pushed onto a conveyor belt, and they run up a conveyor belt, and then there are people picking through manually, separating out contamination or hazards, et cetera. And so we need to make sure that the stuff coming in the line is not going to harm them. And so we wanted to understand what materials are coming through the line that could be problematic to your staff. And then could some of that material actually be harmful to your equipment? Maybe shut it down or jam it up or wear it out. And then also what materials are coming through that reduce the value of that material and make it difficult to sell it? Because ultimately, if our MRF operators can't sell the product, then why are we bothering to collect it? And just to give you a sense, in 2012, the, uh, an economic development study was done, and they found that our MRF operators managing uh, municipal solid uh, recyclables, excuse me, municipal recyclables, had about $746 million in sales. And that's just bottles, cans, and paper. It doesn't include the mattresses, the electronics, et cetera. And so it gives you a sense of how large the industry is in just Connecticut. So from the list of trying to understand, is it detrimental to your staff? Is it harming people that work there, our neighbors? Or is it harmful to your equipment? Or does it impact your commodities? We came out with a list of what is acceptable. So generic changes or big changes, pizza boxes are in. They want our cardboard. No uh, foil, no hood, no liners, but grease is okay. Black plastic is okay. Nursery pots and planter pots are in. Out, no loose bottle caps, no shredded paper, no plastic bags, and no expanded polystyrene, which you may refer to as styrofoam. And then some things we just have to recognize that they're just trash. Are there particular programs that may collect these items? Maybe. But I would say these are materials that don't have 60, you know, they're not accessible to 60% of the population. They're very difficult. They're not collected in curbside programs and probably not collected at your transfer station. And so if we get back to why quality matters, if we can't create good products, if we can't provide really good materials to make it easy for them to separate it, meet those specifications to allow them to sell it, to make it into a new product that we can buy, then we need to do better. We need to be able to complete that cycle. And so it tells us that we are on the front end of that line and we play a very important role. And so I know that we can do better. You know, when we were creating the list, I can tell you the recycling staff was surprised at a number of things. We're all like, what? I didn't know that. And so there is um, some surprises. And I just ask you to be uh, patient with yourself and the system that we're all going to learn and change our behavior as, as we can. So can anybody identify what this is? It's jammed mm -hmm. up. So this is a conveyor that goes up. It usually has like rotations. These all rotate and they usually fluff materials up. And as you can see, it can't fluff up anything because they're all jammed with plastic mm -hmm. film and plastic bags and maybe wire. And can you tell what this is? It's a van. And so all the facilities get this much material in that jam up the equipment. And every morning break, afternoon break, and lunch break, one to two men have to jump into the equipment and manually cut all that plastic. Mm. So these employees, of course, are our neighbors. And so we can do better by them by keeping plastic bags and plastic film out of the system. And this is how much he cut during that 15 minute yeah. break that I was seeing. So another problem, of course, is bad materials. It wasn't just 
plain old plastic bag, but bagged materials. And when they did the study or the characterization of our single stream, what they found is that um, probably half of the contamination that we had was bad stuff. And when they broke open all the bags, they found half of the bag stuff was beautiful, clean recyclables. Mm -hmm. And the other half of the bag stuff was just trash. So can you tell the difference between the recycling and the trash? Mm -hmm. It's because they're the same picture. <laughs> because the point is, is that when you're standing on the line and that material is coming by at a really good pace, they can't tell the difference either. So they're just going to throw it away. So don't bag your recyclables. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I say that loud enough? Don't bag your recyclables. <laughs> <laughs> this is glass. This is glass from our Mars. Does it look like glass? No. no. And that's because it's so heavily contaminated oh. with lip balm, toothpaste, razors, prescription bottles, pens, batteries, etc. Anything that's smaller than a two inch by two inch square box. Most of which, none of it is acceptable in the system. Will fall through and contaminate plus the, the glass. And so it just tells us we can do better. And batteries. So recently we have re-met with the MRF operators um, because we wanted to check in and, and see how the list was doing, were there any changes. And while a couple of years ago their big thing was like, ah, bags, shredded paper, all the caps. They're now talking about fire. Um, lithium batteries cause a lot of problems. And it's not just uh, recycling, it's for trash containers too, but mostly for recycling. If you put a lithium battery or even a toy with a lithium battery, mm -hmm. it can smolder and catch fire. And I can tell you that all the facilities have fires almost weekly. So again, keep your batteries out and we can do better. Some other items that they rolled off, which completely floored me. I mean, it's pretty basic, no syringes, no propane tanks. Yes, we have to tell you no ammunition. <laughs> and apparently also lawnmower blades. I, that would surprise me. And knives. Yeah, they get a lot of knives. Even though they get metal utensils, they also get a lot of knives. And, and if you want to say unsafe on the line for your staff, that's a big one. And then they just say, you know, out of, they don't really want our diapers and our tampon applicators to come through the system. And they do. So again, it's not trash. It's a recycling uh, program and its materials that have value that can be recovered. So this is the website for RecycleCT.com. We provide educational materials for municipalities and individuals and we also have a RecycleCT wizard. This is a search tool and you can type in a uh, battery or I'm not sure, a bottle or jug or styrofoam or whatever your question is and it will give you a response. And municipalities can put this on their website. I don't know, do you have it on your website? Yeah, we have a link to it on public works. And nonprofits can as well and community groups can as well. The state has purchased the license so everybody can use the same device. And so what happens is it's also updated. So if you put the same question in or a number of people have the same question, if it comes up to about maybe five or six times, I actually add it, and I'll add it to the wizard. But if I don't get people asking questions, I may not know if it's an issue. Um, I can tell you, uh, recently, people typed in children. <laughs> <laughs> so what was I the answer? <laughs> That's right. And if you're curious, they should not be put in the recycling bin nor the trash bin. But um, it is forever. It is ever changing because we have new products coming on board all the time. And you also have a way of asking a specific question. So if you're really stumped and you can't find it and you're not sure, those questions also come to me. And don't be surprised if I say, "Could you send me a picture?" Because there's always these new products. I mean, we, you know, I don't. 
know everything. I don't go to every store and buy every product. And so it is sort of a, an indicator that uh, we have to learn along the way. Other materials that we have are some of the materials that you have tonight. You can download any of these and print them yourself. So if we ran out or if you want to share them with friends, they can print them as well. And then we have posters for schools like schools. Now this program was designed specifically for the residential stream or residents, but that doesn't mean businesses can't use it. It just means it's not really intended for businesses. So if you were a large store like Walmart or Target, or maybe you're a manufacturing company, this really may not apply. But if you're a smaller business and you have a single stream program, by all means, I encourage you to follow these guidelines. And the big takeaway is there's a difference between what is acceptable in our blue bin and what is recyclable. There's a lot of things that are recyclable, but that doesn't mean they're acceptable in our blue bin. And we just want things that are clean and no food. They don't have to be scrubbed and washed and you know, brushed, but if you could at least rinse them. The things that might need a little bit more cleaning would be tuna cans, cat, peanut butter, and maybe mayonnaise. And that's it. So could you turn on the lights? Is that possible? Because now it's the time for the quiz. You ready to see your quiz? Of course she does. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm not going to be easy to it. It's really hard. No. I'll start you off with some easy stuff. All right, this is how easy you're going to be. What do you think? In or out? Out. Good. In or out? In. I take the weight This is a half and half? In. This has little cherry tomatoes? In. It's actually in. It's a container. Tells me recycle of clean and dry store drop off. That is rich. That is rap. What about the metal cap? If I have a lot of jar. So if you have a glass jar with a, um, a metal lid, that is in. What's a challenge is the plastic bottle caps, mm -hmm. as well as beer bottle caps. But lids are fine. Question. Should they be separated? I missed that question. Should they be on the glass container or separated from them? Metal lids are fine separate. So this is a bag of beautiful recyclables. Oh, Are you sure that they've been rinsed? Oh, no. There's no one. Oh, All right, this is going to be tricky. This is one of those things that now this is like the, this would hold cans. It's like a new can. Oh, yeah. So this is actually out. And it's complicated because it says it's it's made out of 96% recycled content, mm -hmm. which you're like, great, mm -hmm. but it's not I can acceptable. still cut that apart. Excuse me? I can still cut that apart so that the birds don't get their heads in the ground. Yeah. But if you're putting it in your trash, it's trash. an issue if it's litter, mm -hmm. but if you're putting it in your trash, these are designed not to injure animals. Sure. They're the new design. Mm -hmm. Is there something else you can do with it? No, yeah. it's trash. Sure. Triple. No, this is trash. This is trash. Oh, wrong side. That was a test. That was a test. Good, whoever caught me on that. Is this held a, uh, a lock? So this is actually out. However, if you wanted to pull the cardboard off, you could throw it in, you could, but otherwise it is out. 
A Starbucks cup. Oh. This is actually in. And I would take the cap off. Yeah. Soda can. Yeah. And what else could I do with it? Does everybody know what happens if you don't redeem it? No. State, gets money. State gets money. Did you know that? It goes to the general fund. Mm -hmm. So you can either redeem it for yourself or contribute and support the state. Thank you very much. <laughs> in Milford, we uh, uh, Milford our alternative high school collects yes. those and yeah. uses them, redeems them, and then uses it for class trips. We collect those at the transfer station. Yeah. So did you hear that? They collect them at the transfer station and the fundraising for you program. Nice. Okay, you guys, tricky. Yeah. Oh, you guys are good. Take the spray off. Okay, who still reads newspapers? Yeah, this is out, and you can bring it back to the retail store. You know what they call this, so you must know what it's called. It's a spiral bound can. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, Murph operators hate them. Mm -hmm. So this would not only be Pringles, but it might be Comet or Bonami or uh, the company where you smash it and you have like cinnamon rolls. Yeah. Yeah. All of that is wound materials, and they don't want any of them. Okay, that is out. Okay, I'm going to give you a really tricky one. Right. You ready? Prescription bottles? Oh, right. Police station. Police station. There's nothing, There's nothing in it. it. Oh. Empty prescription. Oh. It is out. But what about my vitamins? Use oh. <laughs> them. This is where it gets tricky. So this is glass, and it's in. And the reason being that it's in is because of its size. And the reason that this is out is because of its size. And so small things that fall through the grate of the two by two, find my little thing in here, fall through the system. So if you don't want to measure and you just want to throw all away your small bottles, it's completely understand. But if you were an Uber recycler, which I'm assuming most of you are because you're sitting through an hour of me chatting about recycling, if you have a two by two and it falls through, it's going to contaminate the glass. However, most of our vitamin bottles are so big, whether they're plastic or glass, it just won't fall through, and those are in. Did everybody follow that? Sure, I have a question. Yeah. With that glass bottle, it's got a plastic lid on it. Do you keep the lid on it? Or do you keep the lid on it? Keep caps on. Wow, so you guys are so good. I don't know how to trick you. Uh, is there another use? Take it back to the computer. Take it back to the computer. This is in. And again, if for Uber recyclers, if you're interested, this particular bottle has a plastic film on it. And it's actually very difficult for MRF operators to, when they're scanning, they can't read this. And they read it as a different kind of a plastic. And so it is a problem for them, but they're accepting it because this is good plastic and we want it. However, it's a problem. And so what it tells us is that sometimes we have an opportunity to create change in that if you really love this product, you could call the manufacturer and let them know, I love your product, but I hate your packaging because it messes up my recycling program in my home town. So there are ways in which you can create change. And I say that because I'm a big uh, Teddy, Teddy peanut butter fan, and I always buy it in glass. That's my preference. However, they're slowly taking away the glass. In fact, they recently put it up a dime for glass, but the rest of it's in plastic. But I prefer not to buy it in plastic. And so at some point, when they completely phase it out, I'm probably going to have to write a teddy. Hey, please bring back my glass. And so it's a great opportunity to let you know that you, know, you can have an impact as a consumer to write a company and ask them to package their things differently. I usually kept that off. Mm -hmm. I have a closet. Instant coffee. Mm -hmm. And it's a plastic. I usually 
Did you hear that? They slice it off. See, you guys are yeah. different. So I heard at the beginning somebody was talking about, I don't understand that you can take milk cartons, but you can't take this. I know you're already saying no. This is a no. It has plastic inside. Mm -hmm. It actually has to do with the wet strength of the paper. And what that means, I do not. <laughs> So if there's any paper engineers in the room, please tell us what that means. But when I speak to the carton council, um, they do say that there's a difference between milk cartons and even juice boxes and cartons of ice cream. And so they say that they this changes the specification, and so we've been asked to keep it out. So that's an help. All right. Well, I'm kind of coming down. I really don't have anything really hard for you. This is like easy stuff. Easy. You can't tell it's really crushed, but it is. I have a, a question about the plastic you take to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. uh, two things specifically, uh, like bounty towel, big things with all that printing on, they take that. Mm -hmm. And what about the bags with the zip, the plastic bags we all buy with a little zip lock, zipper things? So the, the wrap program, which takes plastic film, which includes plastic bags and other wrap. Um, that includes a plastic that is stretchy, so that packaging around your toilet papers, paper towels, any other products like this, is acceptable in the plastic wrap program. So you can put it with all your other plastic bags. Other examples of what is acceptable is uh, bubble wrap, newspaper bags, some uh, cereal bags, and it includes Ziploc bags. However, the challenge is, is that they have to be clean and dry. Mm -hmm. And so um, somebody asked me the other night whether or not you can do saran wrap. And you can, but it has to be clean and dry. To be honest, I, I'm not that good. <laughs> so um, I'll leave it up to you to decide how uber you want to be. When I said zip, I meant really the, the slider thing. Yep, that's OK. Yeah, you don't have to take that off. You don't have to take that off. Do we have to cut the ziplocks off? No, you don't have to cut it off. Well, good for you. Yeah, the Uber folks. Yes, sir. What do you do with shredded paper? Great question. So, shredded paper is an example of something that's recyclable, but it's not acceptable. And that's because the MRF operators have a number of problems. One, it goes everywhere when it comes in the system. It actually becomes an air quality issue for them, and it contaminates pretty much anything in the facility. They end up capturing very little, and most of it ends up being thrown away. The label in my recycling bin says you can put shredded paper in a clear plastic bag. You cannot put shredded paper in your bin. It just means that they haven't updated their sticker. So the label is... That's right. And, you know, let me finish this, and then I'll get to that issue, too. So um, for shredded paper, uh, you could do a couple of things. One, I encourage you to shred only what you absolutely need to shred. And then if you don't have an option, it, it, it's okay for it to be put in the trash. If you were trying to recycle it, you might encourage your town or the committee to have shredding events. And then I encourage the municipality to try to work with a contractor that will accept pre-shredded paper. Many will, not all, so you have to call around. But um, we find that more communities are offering one or two shredding events a year that helps. Um, there are some communities that are collecting shredded paper at the transfer station and it's, separate, it's collected separately. So there are ways in which to recover it, but you have to deal with it in a different way. In terms of your question about the label being wrong, so um, recycling education, promotion, and outreach is a challenge. When we came up with this campaign, believe it or not, I've been working on it for four years, and it's been out for two. Now, when we announced it, I would say half of the municipalities were like, cool, that's great. And some of them were like, I just printed my new stickers and my new brochures, and I don't have money in the budget to reprint them for three to four years. And so this is where we are 
taking a large ship that's moving and trying to turn, and I would say we're about halfway there. And that's because we have a lot of municipalities that already have these stickers and their brochures, et cetera. And some are struggling, they're still at the in between where the web page may be up to date, but maybe the paper isn't because we don't, you know, cost money. And so it's trying to be patient. But if you follow these guidelines, you do your town a service by having cleaner materials. Is there a question over here? Yeah, yeah. Uh, trash. Because uh, I heard that you could take them to a supermarket, but if there are other markets, I'm not aware of. I would say good for good for crafting. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, I think that somebody gave me a great big moon plant, and it was covered with plastic that has a recycle and a tooth in the middle of it. I mean, I know I can't put it in my recycle bin. Actually, that would probably be that it's plastic film. Yeah, so in other words, I can put it in with my newspaper bag. You can put it in with your newspaper bags as long as it's clean and dry. Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm trying. Okay. And I'm going to go for the woman behind. Yeah, I know you've been keep, you keep raising your hand. I'm always conflicted about the, uh, the rotisserie chicken when it comes in that whole plastic thing. And it's just a mess, and I don't know whether to actually wash it, put it, wash it. it or just trash it. Wash I would say it's your call. I can tell you that. Sometimes I trash the whole thing, sometimes I just trash the bottom, and I'll rinse the top. So it's really up to you. You know, we can't do everything, you know, um, but you just do your best. Is that good? Yes, all the way in the back. Hi, sorry I came in late. Um, this has been driving me nuts. Um, try it online, I'm not using the right word, this hard plastic no. on a lot of these cardboard things, did you already address that? Yeah, so I'm going to ask the group, is, is what she's holding in or out? Hi, oh. yeah. Take, the out. Take the cardboard and recycle that. That's what I've been doing, but I'm like, am I, I just don't want the whole thing to end up trash because I'm putting, so this is not recyclable. Right. It's not. So Thank there's a you. difference between what is recyclable and what is acceptable. And at right. this point, this material is not acceptable. Yeah. And this is also the type of packaging that Walmart is going to discontinue. Mm -hmm. So that tells you that the industry is aware that this packaging is not helpful. Mm -hmm. Which is great. Mm -hmm. It means that they're redesigning. How they're going to redesign, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it is exciting that they're aware that this is an issue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we pay attention to the recycle the number, the plastic number anymore? Or? We don't. So I would say, think about it in terms of, so usually when you think of the arrows with the numbers, you're looking at plastic items. Mm -hmm. And that's because it's a resin identification. Mm -hmm. So it tells you what kind of plastic it is. It's only helpful in very small cases. I would really encourage you to think about the things that are acceptable in the blue bin are containers. Bottles, jars, jugs, berry containers, mm -hmm. cookie containers, take out containers that are plastic. And that's pretty much it. If it's not a container, it's not acceptable. And so if you have a toothbrush and it has a number something, or if you have you know, a chapstick that has a number something, it's not acceptable. And so it's easier to think about it in terms of containers. Oh, good. With the blue. Uh, if you have a peanut butter jar all cleaned out, it has a good size lid on it. Does that lid go in? Yes, that can go in. So is it anything over an inch size of lid? Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, so most lids are in because lids tend to be bigger. It's the caps that tend to be small. And so the caps are out, but the lids are in. We also do metal, metal recycling um, of various sorts. And do things like um, the metal lids on liquor bottles, you know, the, oh, yeah. the um, like wine bottle. aluminum lids on liquor bottles and things like needles and pins and scissors, should those go in metal recycling? So it's a separate thing. It doesn't go in the regular recycling. You have this to is a perfect opportunity for me to introduce Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Does everybody know Steve? Uh, uh, I've uh, got something with the city of Milford. <laughs> Everything I've learned about recycling has been from Cheryl, <laughs> bothering her with questions that I don't know. Um, but I think one of the challenges that you raise is the wishful recycling. 
and we're really talking about quality versus quantity. Uh, there is at our transfer station, we're limited in, in the space that we have there, but we do provide a metal, um, a, a special metal for recycling. So things like, you know, some broken pair of scissors or the lawnmower blades and things like that could go in that metal recycling if you bring it up to the transfer station. Um, things like sharps and needles, um, certainly you just want to dispose of them properly as a health risk. Uh, put them in another container so it doesn't become a uh, risk to somebody else who's collecting the garbage or sorting it and put it in the trash. Um, little pins and things like that, I would just put in the trash personally. It's just they're too small to make any difference in the larger metal recycling. Um, and uh, offer also at the city transfer site, we have the mattress recycling program. We have waste oil and antifreeze collections uh, at our transfer station on Orinoke Road. We offer, uh, we have the single screen container, so if you're, sometimes my container gets a little too full, I'll take it up there and, and put it in. We've experimented, not successfully, uh, but we experimented with offering a container just for clean beverage glass, a bottle glass. And um, I've got photos of anybody, and we had the container well labeled, um, but unfortunately the wishful recycling, I've seen everything from Yankee candles with the candles still intact, the rulers, pens, uh, peanut butter, plastic peanut butter jars, not Teddy, but the plastic still full of peanut butter. So, you know, our big challenge is trying to get folks like you that are really care about trying to do the right thing and help spread that to our family and friends. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm the recycling police at home, so I'm, my tissue paper is an example and uh, is not recyclable. Uh, but, you know, uh, wrapping paper, oftentimes people feel like that should be recycled, so I'm constantly pulling stuff out that my family puts in trying to do the right thing. So um, we do have on our Public Works website, we do have the uh, link to the um, What's In, What's Out campaign. Um, certainly, um, our website also offers things like don't bag the um, bag, um, and that's, big, our, that's our biggest challenge. If I just do some street side uh, checking, um, it, uh, I did this uh, a few months back, uh, about, and it's just at dusk, and I went up and down my street, uh, about 20 recycling bins, and most people were trying to do the right thing, but you know they were putting things in there that shouldn't have been in there. Probably, I think, when I looked at it, it was about 25% had stuff in there. You know, needed to be really pulled out if you're, if you're trying to do it well, so. I have two questions. On the bulk recycling, which I love, uh, the bulk yes. pickup, which I love, if it's recyclable and it's in there, do you recycle it? No, so well, there's, uh, there's a, an exception to that. So during the bulk recycling that's underway right now, um, there's, um, we have our, um, Materials that are metal get uh, get picked up, and those get taken and recycled. Our electronics get picked up, and that's recycled. Um, and um, uh, the mattresses are not picked up and recycled at curbside. Uh, we do offer the recycling at our transfer station for the metal re uh, mattress recycling program. Um, the green uh, the green waste uh, yard waste. Uh, is picked up and that's recycled. So we're recycling that through a local uh, composter. So, um, so we are recycling the yard waste during bulk if it's separated and, or tied in four foot bundles, um, and um, metal and then electronics. And also tires are another thing that we do pick up and recycle. Uh, and so. the, the other question is I recently got plastic bags with a notice that I can recycle clothing. Yes, well, that seems like a new program. That's a new program um, called uh, Simple Recycling that we textile. And it's just not textiles, it's any really household items that you put in the bag. And those are designed to be uh, filled up and then placed the, during the week. We have in Milford every two weeks for the recycling. Our containers are green, not blue. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, that's right. And um, if you put them out with your recycling container, they'll be picked up and they'll leave you bags for the next time. We do have, uh, for people uh, that want to do it but uh, miss their recycling, they can bring it up to the transfer station and pick it up. 
The, really, the benefit of this program is, is you still have a choice, and a lot of people, if they want to take their textiles or other uh, household items to whatever local organization is recycling, they're certainly welcome to do it. It's just a convenience uh, to our residents. And this diverts the textiles from going into our waste stream that's being burned. So we're, we're reducing our tipping fees. Right now, unfortunately, recycles, it costs more to dispose of recycles than it does our solid waste. Uh, but this also allows us, by diverting materials out of our waste stream that gets burned, uh, we also get a small uh, uh, rebate from the simple recycling folks. So we're, it is benefiting us to a small degree. Uh, but in the past, we uh, were getting paid to recycle, and now we're having to pay. So it's a big, big change. That's just really interesting to me because a lot of clothing is plastic. Polyesters are plastic. So they sort through. Yeah. Uh, there's three tiers that they, as I understand it, I haven't, I don't know all of the details, but they'll sort through the, the these materials. <clears throat> they will resell the, the, the highest tier materials uh, that can be resold through consignment stores through the markets. Um, it, the clothing and materials that are still uh, usable but not fashionable here will get exported uh, to other markets. And then last, the, the, the least quality of the materials get turned into rags and other, other materials. So it's been used. Yeah, about 85% is in reuse value, and 5 to 10% is usually for rags and other for insulation, and then 5% is residual. And it's really, and just so you know that um, Simple has moved into Connecticut, so they're processing locally. So they're doing that processing. And so you'll also find um, some of their markets are going into New Jersey, where apparently there's people that literally will be like, oh, this is a polyester blend, this is a women's summer dress, this is a, and they actually separate it, and they have their own specifications. It's a, it's a fascinating subset. Yeah, yeah. Who's in charge? Yeah. <laughs> so let's see here, right? For sure. Mm -hmm. There was a um, a slide where you show the emerging domestic markets, mm -hmm. including there was a reference to a Connecticut. Mm -hmm. If I read it correctly, a Connecticut market. Yeah. I wonder if you can touch on the emerging Connecticut markets that you're aware of. Number one and number two. The second part of the question is the Connecticut League of Conservation Voters indicated a couple of weeks ago that there are two priorities next year for the legislative session. One is the expansion of the bottle bill, which is a good thing in my estimation because it creates new redemption center opportunities and will create jobs and capture more of what we're now discarding. And number two, they're recommending that we have source separation get away from a single stream. I wonder if you have some comments about that. So in terms of markets, um, you're referring to Urban Mining. Yes. That is a company that actually wants MRF glass. So just so you know, we already have a company called Strategic Materials, and they take bottle bill glass. Okay. Bottle bill glass is not the picture that I showed you. Bottle bill glass is actually quite clean. Um, and has a lot of markets. Murph glass has less markets, and Murph glass is usually the challenge. And so Urban Mining um, makes a posilate. I'm not into construction, but apparently it's uh, something related to concrete production. Mm -hmm. And they can use Murph glass, I think, in, um, as a, like sand. You know, they grind it so fine it can be a substitute for sand. Mm -hmm. and, all the, and all the contaminants come out of it. They do like a second or third um, sort to clean it up. And so that's very exciting. We thought they would set up operation this year. Um, they're actually setting up somewhere in your neck of the woods, mm -hmm. but they're looking at a different site. So I think they're doing multiple sites. We've been told that they're probably going to be set up in 2020, so that's a safe bet. So that's very exciting for Connecticut. Yeah. Um, I can't really speak to legislation, but I can speak to about programs. So um, I'll take your second question, because I can't remember the first. But in terms of the concept of single stream and mixing recyclables, it was really something that came out of industry in the sense that we had, you know, I don't know how it was in your community, but usually you had two trucks. You know, you had the bottles and cans truck, and then you had the fiber truck. Or one week was fiber, you know, paper, and then the second week was bottles and cans. 
or you had the truck with all the little compartments. That's right. And yeah. so what happens is your paper got full faster than your mm -hmm. balls and cans, right. and balls and cans were heavy, and the paper was different, and there were a lot of issues. We also, everybody had one of these. And it sounds like you have carts yet? We have totes now. Yeah, we have totes. Uh, we, we yeah. And so most people have carts and totes, but we used to have, you know, the, bo the box. Right. Mm -hmm. And that was causing a lot of labor issues. Can you imagine all day? And so the industry really uh, moved to single stream because of working comp. Mm -hmm. That it reduced uh, the amount of injuries associated with picking up the materials. And I think everybody felt that the technology could also handle it. But again, the technology and the design was all done before all these new products are coming up. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really sort of a perfect storm. It's not intended to take everything. I think uh, taking having bigger carts, uh, traditionally, you know, it's like carts is not single stream. Carts is a collection, is a collection container. And going single stream was changing the way you collect. And so often they were done at the same time because it makes it easier for residents to understand the change. You know, it all happens at once. But because of that, people just thought you could put anything in there. It's plastic. It's metal. They'll deal with it, you know, the wish side. And so it has become a perfect storm. I don't know what communities are looking at in terms of Connecticut, but I can tell you I just read an article that Ontario is moving back to dual stream. Mm -hmm. We also have a number of communities that never went to single stream, and I think they're pretty excited and probably looking at the rest of us with like, ha ha. Right. <laughs> However, our facilities are still single stream. Right. And so, how do you help facilities who put large amounts of money and in investment into processing this material transition to another system? And I think that is a question. And I, just so you know, this question comes up pretty much every time. Mm -hmm. And so, it is something to ponder, what if? I, um, I'm, I'm never one that likes to say it will never work. It's like, how could it work? It's like, how could we imagine it working? Because really, ultimately, we want better materials. Right. We want cleaner materials so the MRF operators have cleaner stuff that can sell. You know, do we want to compete with other states? You bet. <laughs> we want cleaner stuff. But um, it's really trying to support the whole cycle. <coughs> so I don't remember your other question. Sure. Yeah. Great well, job. Thanks so much for that. Yeah. I have a question. I need a little clarity on the Say like during the summer, I planted tomatoes and it has a cage around it, so now I'm done with them. So how do I dispose of that container? The plant, you know, that you buy from the um. Yeah, it's, I don't have any on me, but if it's actual nursery pot, like that yes. hard plastic, mm -hmm. and it comes in maybe orange or green or brown, mm -hmm. if as long as you clean it out and there's no soil in it, it's fine. The stuff that they don't want are the little crinkly six packs mm -hmm. that our little animals come in. They don't really want those. Mm -hmm. I think they back to the place where I bought it for previous year. That's right. A lot of places they will actually take them back. I know the place that I go to, they take them back as well. Another thing to know is that you can take packaging materials to the store and things like that. Uh, so I keep uh, packing peanuts and bubble wrap, and every once in a while I make it. That's great. It's a challenge. You know, a lot of people think, which can? You know, does it go in the recycling can or the trash can? And really, we have multiple bins. There's the retail, there's the transfer station, it's bringing back to, you would ask questions about batteries, you know, you bring it back to Best Buy or whatever. So it, it is a challenge, but it's sort of like we bought it from lots of places and we have to bring it back from lots of places. So one so thing I want to also mention, so I don't forget, <laughs> this Saturday, at Public Works, we have our Regional Hazardous work, uh, Waste uh, Collection event at 83 Ford Street. And uh, coinciding with that is the fire department collects the propane tanks over at Siemens Lane uh, facility. So uh, that's an opportunity to bring uh, a lot of the things that we can't get rid of here. But we also have, like you just uh, mentioned, at Lowe's Home Depot, they will take the batteries, the light bulbs, the plastic bags, our transfer station electronics. We also take the household batteries at the electronics then as well. So, 
So that's it for questions. We're going over time, but I thank you very much. Yeah, I'll stick around for a few minutes.